just let people join in yeah. when we access or, or yeah. pick up the recording. That's what we'll do. We'll just keep troubleshooting until we get that connection fixed. Okay. 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 To track that down. So. In order to honor our time, your time, yeah. Um, yeah. not go too much over. Um, but I, I want to say welcome and thank you for coming. Um, this truly is an important part of our mission. Um, our mission is to form servants for Jesus' sake. And um, that doesn't simply mean what we do with our um, yeah. pre-pastor yeah. or our pastoral students really and our diaconal students. students. It really means serving the church and helping as, as the gospel goes there. forth yeah. and leads us forward. Um, it, it enables... Um, us all to recognize what it's like to live as a servant under Jesus Christ, the master servant, right? And we rejoice in, in the opportunities that God provides. Um, we're here for week three of um, Dr. Chambers' look at Lutheran distinctives. And by now you've already picked up that um, the Lutheran distinctives okay. are not uh, tonsure uh, as a haircut, right? <laughs> and it's not just that the pastors may wear a clerical sometimes. It's not the pectoral cross, it's nothing in our accent, it's not something that we eat that's, well, maybe it is. Well, I, yeah. um, there are Lutherans it's from Norway, I used to live next to one who loved Ludifisk, yeah. and that was like pretty much a Lutheran box. thing, but um, being Lutheran is distinctive in a lot of ways that are internal, ways that, um, that matter to faith and are drawn from scripture and are understanding the confession and the confessions, and we're Really thankful for Dr. Chambers doing this. Um, yeah. We're glad to offer this class to you, to the church at large, and um, it is yeah, it is um, because of the contributions that come in from you, your churches, and from around Canada that um, we depend on, critically important, um, that enable us to carry on everyday oh. business, and this is part of what we do. So thank you for okay. that, and we hope that you oh. enjoy the course um, and that. Um, in that Lutheran distinctive, it uh, helps you better understand part of who you are as part uh, of the family of God. Dr. Chambers, we'll let you Lutheran start with prayer and Dr. Chambers. Um, take it away. Sure. Yeah. Good to see you again tonight. If you're back from uh, from a previous week too, welcome back. If you're joining us for the first time, thank you for coming. I hope you'll find this to be um, interesting and stimulating. Um, as Dr. Gimbel says, Lutheran distinctives, again, I know I talked about that on the first night a little bit. Um, while I was looking for some material uh, for tonight's session, um, I ended up browsing around on lots and lots of web pages and finding the images I, that I'm interested in and so forth. And I ran across a website from one of my seminary classmates who's uh, a parish pastor in Texas now. And he had a whole series of uh, sermons on what it is to be Lutheran. So I watched one of his sermons, I thought, my goodness, has he ever gotten old over the years? <laughs> Part of it. Um, but it, uh, of course, I haven't seen him for 30 years, right? Um, funny how that always happens to other people, right? Um, and uh, along with that, though, I was struck by his list of things. And his take on what it is to be Lutheran was much more built around sort of the the doctrinal things that are right at the core of our faith, okay. uh, means um, of grace, law and gospel, um, salvation by grace okay. itself, um, and I thought, you know what, I'm not really covering those things at all in this class. But then I realized, yeah. yes, but I sort of talked about that a little in the first week, that what we're looking at are things that are more unique yeah. or a little bit different in the way in which those core things affect our thinking about life and faith. So, um, after I sort of set myself back on track with that realization, then I was able to go on again, because I thought, oh, I'm not talking about all this, these critically central things. But the things that we are talking about, including tonight's session on the two kingdoms, um, I think really are a unique part of what we have to offer to the wider church. and. Um, a special set of insights uh, based on the things that we also share with all other Christians in terms of salvation by grace through faith and God's work through the sacraments and so forth. Well, not all Christians quite see that the way we do, but anyway, if you catch my drift. So let's gather our thoughts together and then we'll 
start looking at the distinctive thing for this evening. Absolutely. Gracious Father, we thank you for bringing us together as you have again yeah, tonight. Thanks, yeah. Thank you that we can spend this time together and think um, deeply yeah. and we pray well about some of the um, characteristic things that we have received from those who have gone before don't, don't worry, and those who have thought a great deal about how it is that you work in the world and how you call us to live as your forgiven and redeemed people in Jesus. Open our minds, open our hearts, enable us to enjoy this time together, and bless us, we pray, so that we can live as your people um, out in the world where you would have us be and where you are working always um, to build your kingdom. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I realize I'm kind of peering around cameras to see some of you. Um, it, it, it's probably easier for you to move yep. than me. Sorry about that. Unless you're hiding behind cameras on purpose, in which case yeah, we will. that's fine. I guess I get nothing to suggest in that case. Um, but uh, anyway, <laughs> I'll do the best I can. If, if you need to move, I see there are some other seats around here too. So anyway, tonight um, we want to be looking at two kingdoms, um, finding God at work both in the church and in the world. That's the broad topic. So, um, if you've been with us previous weeks, I, I, I try to find some kind of image that captures in sort of a metaphorical way what it is we're talking about here. So, can you imagine how this image gets us started on this topic? Black and white keys. Black and white keys. Oh, well, <laughs> I, that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good thought. Some would see theology as very black and white. Um, I would probably see more gray keys if, if I were framing it that way. But um, something else in that picture. Worship? Two hands. Two hands. Two hands. Left hand, right hand. We're going to be seeing how that pertains to, um, the, the play, to the playing of God's music in the world, maybe, to the way in which God conducts the symphony of the world. Um, he's not just plunking out a tune the way some of us do, you know, one finger, one hand. Um, but he plays a beautiful tune, and it involves a number of coordinated actions that are different from each other, but together make the whole thing happen. Characteristically, we do realize that God works in the world in two distinct kingdoms. This is one of Luther's very characteristic contributions to broader Christian thought. Uh, this fellow in 1938 said, there's really no clearer explanation of how it is that we live in the world um, than this. He thinks this is one of the very best. I presume he's a Lutheran. I don't know too much about this guy, Franz Lau. Um, Paul Althaus, though, he's a name that we've mentioned before here, um, prominent German Lutheran theologian. And he says this is one of the most valuable and enduring treasures of his theology. So I tend to agree. It's kind of neat once we think about it. <clears throat> Before Luther arrived at the Lutheran understanding, though, um, <laughs> he did think about <coughs> two kingdoms in a different sort of way, a more traditional way, probably the way that you and I would first try to explain two kingdoms too, if we just sort of heard that term and thought, what does that have to do with <coughs> theology? Um, he saw a totally different pair of kingdoms at work in the world than what he eventually ended up coming to see. But at the beginning, he saw this oppositional pair instead. Um, on the one hand, the secular world, which you can see in the table here, right? Its ruler is Satan. Its power is the law. It's all about force, in a sense, and might and power and all that, right? Its view of God is that God's angry and God loves to punish. If you sort of, well, I don't know, maybe that's different in our day now, but I think in a lot of times and places, that's what people assume about God, right? That's why most religions have some kind of sacrifice that people have to make. Uh, because there's an inbred awareness that God is angry with us and we have to get right with him. Um, 
And who belongs to that world, the secular world? Well, really, everybody except for Christians, right? And we can probably think of even passages from the Bible that talk about us having left the world and come into the church, into Christ's kingdom instead. So, you see, this understanding of two kingdoms, or these two kingdoms, are really quite strongly opposed to each other, aren't they? Different rulers, they operate by different powers, different understanding of God, and different membership, which becomes clear when we think about the church as the other of those kingdoms, right? Because that's the place where we encounter God as our ruler. We're out from under the rule of Satan, but under him instead. And we're governed by the gospel. We know that God is merciful. He loves to forgive. And this is only <coughs> true for us who are Christians, right? Those in the world, none of this is theirs. They don't understand it. It's foolishness to them. Their minds are blinded. All these kinds of things that we read in the scripture. Okay? So you can sort of see the, the great arm wrestle there. Um, no, this is not Brenda and me, as in <laughs> previous weeks. <laughs> this is a much more serious arm wrestle. Brenda on that. the left, right? <laughs> yeah, no, no, we're not going there, Vern. Don't tempt me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this pair of opposing kingdoms, I mean, this is well grounded in Scripture, right? That's why many of us sort of, as we come to know Scripture, we understand this very well. Yeah, of course this is how it works, right? <clears throat> Jesus in Matthew 12, telling this um, story about uh, kingdoms being divided, no city or no house will stand if it's divided, right? He comes up with this way of talking about it when people have accused him of casting out demons by the power of Satan. And he says that's ridiculous, right? How, how could that possibly be? If, if Satan were casting out demons, he'd be fighting against himself, right? How will his kingdom stand? Aha! From the lips of Jesus, right? He's recognizing Satan has a kingdom. If it's by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you. See? There's both of them in the same little anecdote, right? There is this opposition between Satan and his kingdom and the kingdom of God. We're not, you know, making this up if we look at things that way. And Luther never repudiated that view that there are those two kingdoms at work in the world. Um, I don't know if, if you're acquainted with this from our liturgy, but um, in Luther's German Mass in 1526, um, instead of having people just pray the Lord's Prayer the way we typically do now, he wrote a paraphrase of the Lord's Prayer. For each of the petitions in the Lord's Prayer, he kind of turned it into a couple of sentences. And that actually is in our hymnal too. Anybody recognize this bit here from our hymnal? I think it's in Divine Service 4, if you've used that one. I don't know, maybe you're a Divine Service 1 congregation, or, you know, yeah. 1 and 2 maybe, or I don't know how adventurous you are about all those kinds of things, but in his paraphrase of the petition, Your Kingdom Come, this is how he phrases it, right? May your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and all who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son, by faith, that the number of Christians may be increased. Isn't that a beautiful petition? Right? And it's growing straight out of this recognition that this is what we pray for, and this is what God's doing in the world, bringing people out of that kingdom and into this one, right? Because that one ain't His. And we need to pray for those people, and we do when we pray the Lord's Prayer. That's what Luther is recognizing. That's part of our prayer, that we want God's kingdom to come and to incorporate people who are otherwise blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom. So, comments, thoughts? Okay, jump in if you can. I'm guessing we're not kind of waiting for online questions at this point because we're recording, hey? Okay, yeah, fair enough, all right. God bless you guys and you work on <laughs> Yeah. Thanks be to God. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that sounds a bit premature. But anyway. yeah. I'm optimistic. Okay, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Optimistic. Um, 
So along with that pair of kings of Limstone, as Luther is reading more scripture and thinking more deeply about all this, he also comes to realize there's more going on than just that. God himself is working in the world in two distinct realms, or sometimes we would call them kingdoms. I think I kind of back and forth in this presentation on the term that I use here, but I guess in the title of this talk tonight, I call it two kingdoms. Here I'm referring to it as realms. Can you guess what this picture has to do with it? Well, you've got, uh, I'm thinking, two hands yeah, for the same person. Yeah, right. <laughs> one right, one Yes, down. yes, exactly, right. Yeah, I don't know if you can see the detail there. This is from a, a video that I found online um, looking for something about ambidextrous people. And this is a woman who is ambidextrous, and she does this drawing, you know, mirror images, one pen on the right, one on the left. Does them both at the same time. That's kind of what Luther is coming to realize God is doing. He's working himself. One person in the world, one capital P person in the world, doing two different but complementary matching things at the same time. What gives Luther this idea? Where does he get this insight from? Partly from this, from realizing that what we see in the New Testament is that Jesus and his disciples do not use force, and Jesus is quite adamant about that, that we as Christians are not to use force in our dealings with other people. So, you know, here, famous saying from Sermon on the Mount, right? Don't resist an evil person. Someone strikes you on one cheek, turn the other one, right? Non-resistance, non-force. That's not how the kingdom works. Or, again, from the Sermon on the Mount, right? Everyone angry with his brother, liable to judgment. So that's from Jesus' instruction. What about Jesus' own example? Well, again, when you think about how he responded when evil was done to him, he didn't respond with evil, did he? So, here at his trial, he's accused by the chief priests and the elders. He doesn't even answer, let alone lash back at them. Pilate can't believe it, right? Don't you hear how many things they testify against you? But no answer, not even to a single charge. Pilate just can't get over it. That's not how people respond, right? We respond. We respond appropriately. We respond with the right kind of force to counter the thing that's being done to us. That's just how the world works, guy. Don't you know that? But that's not how Jesus works it. On the other hand, Luther also realizes that God authorizes civil government to use force. That's kind of its point, actually, or one of its points, at least. Somewhat long paragraph here from Romans 13, but um, you've probably heard this at some, in some context. Um, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Why? Well, because there's no authority except from God, and those th that exist have been put in place by God. So if you resist th authority, you're resisting what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Do you want to be on a... Uh, rulers are not a terror to good behavior, but to bad. Oops, skip. I forgot I highlighted that part. Rulers are not a terror to good behavior, but to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Then do good, and you'll receive its approval. Why? It's God's servant for your good when it bears the sword, right? If you do wrong, you should be afraid, for it doesn't carry the sword for nothing. It's the servant of God to carry out his wrath on the person who does evil. Hmm. Hmm. Christians, not to respond with evil or force. Governments, absolutely to respond with evil or force. Totally different. Likewise, in 1 Peter, this apostle writes, 
right? Be subject to every human institution for the Lord's sake, whether to the emperor as supreme, and we probably think, oh yeah, okay, emperors, uh, all right, whatever. Um, the first century context, that was a pretty startling thing to say. Um, what would be an equivalent maybe in our political world today? We don't have too many emperors anymore. This is more than just saying to the prime minister, what would be the right sort of title maybe in our world that would be kind of like the Roman emperor in that world? No, the queen maybe? Oh, well, I, well, she's kind of cuddly and, and harmless, isn't she? <laughs> really? Kind of like saying to a North Korean citizen, Ah, to, uh, Kim Jong -un. okay, yes, think North Koreans, uh, subject to the great leader, right? Or I was, more broadly, I was going to say, uh, subject to, uh, whether to the dictator, yeah, Stalin maybe. Or Hitler. Yeah, something like that, huh? Yeah, mm, that makes us think, right? Yeah. Orchard governors, again, look at the wording here as sent by him to punish those who do wrong and praise those who do right. I can imagine those Christians receiving this letter from Peter, or for that matter, those ones in receiving that letter from Paul in Rome, just having to stop and go, hmm, really? Let me think about that for a little. Somewhere around 1523, Luther realizes it's actually God at work in both of these very different ways. Again, long quote here, but it's kind of an interesting one. God has established two kinds of government among people, right? The first is spiritual, has no sword. Oh, I know I highlighted that bit. Yep, spiritual, has no sword, but it has the word by means of which men are to become good and righteous, so that with this righteousness they may attain eternal life. Ha! Righteousness. that ring a bell from last week? Yes, that's it. Nod your heads. Very good. Yep. Where do we see this one? God administers this righteousness through the word which he's committed to preachers. Right? This is the church. But then, also, the other kind of government is secular government which works not through the word, but through the sword. <laughs> the sword. Right? The rhyme doesn't work very well. Why? So that those who do not want to be good and righteous to eternal life may be forced to become good and righteous in the eyes of the world. Okay? You can't force somebody to become righteous uh, in, in spiritual terms at the point of the sword. But you can certainly force them to be righteous in the eyes of the world, right? Like, no, you're not going to take that little old lady's purse, or, you know, beat your wife, or cheat on your taxes, or whatever. That has nothing to do with eternal life, but it's still good things for people to be prevented from doing, right? That's what this is all about. So, God administers, oops, this righteousness, yeah, through the sword. And although he may not reward this kind of righteousness with eternal life, nonetheless, he still wants peace to be maintained. So again, a few years later, he's talking about this in parallel terms, uh, in a different context. Spiritual government authority, or authority, should direct people vertically toward God so they may do right and be saved. Okay? And the secular government should direct people horizontally toward one another so that property, body, honor, wife, child, house, home, all kinds of goods remain in peace and security and are blessed on earth. Again, none of that actually brings anybody to heaven, but they're good things, right? This is all first article stuff, if you think of the way the creed is organized, right? God the Father is the father of the whole creation. He made it all, he preserves it all, and he does that not just for Christians, but for everybody. 
It doesn't save everybody, but that doesn't mean he doesn't care about everybody. So, I put together a little table here, that one could add more categories to this as well, but it, I think, gives us a sense of how these two kingdoms are both parallel to each other, but also very different from each other. And this left-hand, right-hand way of talking about it, that's Luther's terminology. He applied this terminology to it for the reasons we were talking about earlier, to stress that it's one person doing this. This isn't Satan ruling the one kingdom and God the other. It's all God. So what does God, or how does God work through it? Well, left-hand kingdom, right-hand kingdom. Who's its head? Hmm. Again, think of the creed here. This is one of the fundamental ways we organize our faith. And according to this way of thinking, God the Father is the head of the left-hand kingdom. Again, it applies to everybody around the whole world, not just Christians. That's God the Father stuff, right? He's the God and Father of us all. He sends the rain on the good and the evil alike. As far as God the Father is concerned, it makes no difference whether we're in the faith or not. Well, I mean, don't press that too hard, but in a certain sense, when it comes to this, that's true, right? On the other hand, Christ is the head of the spiritual kingdom, and if he is not our head, um, we're not part of that kingdom. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through him, and so he's the one who the Bible calls the head of the church. That's his bailiwick. Second article stuff, right? Who does it help? Well, we said all people are part of the left-hand kingdom, Christians only in the church. What does it do? Well, the left-hand kingdom preserves the world. How come it's still here? Well, because God in his grace continues to provide for all people all that they need to sustain their bodies and lives. If you're hearing echoes of the catechism here, um, that's purposeful. Um, on the other hand, the right-hand kingdom saves Christ's people. That's specifically what it does. What does it focus on? Left-hand kingdom, physical earth, uh, physical life here in time. Right-hand kingdom, spiritual life in eternity, horizontal and vertical. We talked about that already. Here's a connection to last week. Remember we were talking about the two kinds of righteousness? Yeah. The left-hand kingdom is where our act of righteousness has a part to play. Right? In the world. God doesn't need our good works, but who does? Our neighbor. Our neighbor, exactly. That's right. Our neighbor does. The creation does. The whole created order does. That's where our act of righteousness is part of God's will. Within the church, though, none of that matters at all, right? Under Christ. It's passive righteousness that gets us in. Yeah. Sorry. So, um, I think that uh, which direction does it focus horizontally and vertically? So, horizontally yeah. kind of means like forward through time. Um, you know, in what direction does it focus? Like, you know, uh, in that regard, but then vertically is more spiritually to lift us up higher kind of thing? Or Yeah, good question. I'm using those as shorthands, the horizontal, vertical thing, for a bunch of things. And I guess primarily thinking horizontal in terms of me and you, yeah. you know, between us and other people. Okay. And yes, as you said, and vertically more between us and God okay. is kind of the primary orientation there, right? Yeah. Again, people other than Christians do good works, right? And are often very good people, as far as people are concerned. You know, still sinners like everybody else, but, you know, don't you know upstanding Muslim neighbors or co-workers or so forth, right? We don't have a monopoly on good works that are oriented in this direction. Um, thoughtful, caring people and so forth, well-intentioned. Um, but none of that counts before God. That's the difference there. I, sorry, could just hit the pause button for a minute. Are, how is, what's happening tech? No? Nope. We're going to fix it up. Kaplan? Okay, yeah, I just realized we're recording live on that. Or recording on yeah, that. Yeah, it is recording on yeah. that. Oh, so yeah. it is getting me? Yeah, you were posting it. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, no, no, that's fine. I just realized neither camera is really looking at me. Ah, my over here, over here, <laughs> right in between. That's no good. Okay, anyway, you guys are on top of it. Good, thanks. Yeah. So, how do these two kingdoms deal with sin? In the kingdom of the left hand, sin just gets suppressed and limited. That's really all the police can do, right? They can't deal with the guilt of sin, but they can try to keep a lid on it. Again, that's a good thing, right? It doesn't deal with the substance of the problem, but it's still good to, su to suppress it and protect us from it. It's only in the church that we have pardon and forgiveness for sin, right? And conversely, <laughs> that doesn't actually do a whole lot in and of itself to suppress it, right? We keep being sinners. We keep committing sin. The fact of forgiveness, I mean, okay, it does build up the new self, and so we do become stronger in our faith, and thus less likely over time to commit sin. But in and of itself, the forgiveness of it does not prevent us from doing it again. Right? We all know that pretty well. So maybe I should have kind of drawn a dotted line or you know, put asterisks with exceptions to many of these statements, but sort of, at least in rough terms, you can see there really is quite an interesting uh, difference between how God works with the one hand and how he works with the other, right? So, yeah, evil, the left-hand kingdom, dealt with by punishment. We send people to jail. Um, in the spiritual kingdom, we don't do that. Um, we deal with sin by forgiveness. So, the law, more associated with the uh, left-hand kingdom, gospel with the right. And also in the left-hand kingdom, great differences in status, right? Um, in the church in Corinth, that Paul writes to, um, there are slaves and very wealthy people. And you know what? It's always been like that, right? I mean, there have been sporadic efforts here and there at establishing Christian communes, you know, where on purpose people redistribute their wealth so that there are not these inequalities. But um, certainly in the world, those status differences are rampant. And even in the kingdom, we don't actually usually try to get rid of them. Right? We call each other brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless whether you drive a Mercedes or arrive, you know, on bike, on your bike. Or regardless whether you have, you know, a, a doctor's degree or you're a high school dropout, right? It makes no difference whatsoever. We're all one in Christ Jesus. That's the new reality the right-hand kingdom lays on top of the existing realities in the left-hand kingdom. Comments, thoughts on this table? Okay. Didn't know we had an ambidextrous God, huh? Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Could add that phrase to one of those long creeds, I guess, the Athanasian Creed. Throw that in yeah. there, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ideally, at least, these two forms of government through which God works, um, they're cooperative and not contradictory. Luther was commenting on this verse from Matthew 6 about not serving two masters, right? Why? Because he'll hate the one and love the other, or devoted to one and despise the other. He comments on that, and this is what he says. Yeah, there, he says, Jesus is talking about two masters that are opposed to each other, not masters that govern together. But, he says, there's no contradiction if I serve both God and my prince or emperor at the same time. If I obey the lower one, which one do you think he would mean by the lower one? Right. Yeah, right, exactly. Right. If I obey the lower one, I am obeying the highest one as well, since my obedience moves from the one to the other. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Ideally, we obey both, right? And there shouldn't really be a contrast between that, or a clash between that. Maybe a contrast in some ways, but certainly not a clash. They're not opposed to each other. They're pulling in the same direction. Does that picture work for you? Well, another point you can bring up too, it's like, yeah. if you can't obey him who you can see, how can you obey him who you cannot see? Yeah, there you go. Just yeah, 
Yeah, right. Obeying or, yeah, um, Jesus talks about that in terms of love, too. But you're right, it's both. If you can't love the one you, who's in front of you, how can you love the one who is? Then obey and supply the verb you want in there. Right. So, Gustav Wingren, um, remarkable Swedish theologian, mid-20th century, um, uh, has a very interesting study on, on all this kind of stuff in Luther. And he says, he says it this way, uh, spiritual and earthly governments constitute two kingdoms, but both of these are gods. <laughs> yeah, they're not in opposition to one another. Side by side, both of them fight against the devil. One guided by the law, one guided by the gospel. I don't know if you thought of the government fighting against the devil. Sometimes I think we're tempted to see it maybe on the other side of that equation. <laughs> Especially if you're a native Albertan. <laughs> Not mentioning anything recently. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, right, yeah, yeah, what, stay tuned here, Lauren. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Luther found biblical precedent for this, and biblical warrant for looking at things this way, appreciating both church and state. Um, 1 Timothy 2, this was just the appointed epistle, epistle reading, that I think many of us probably heard on Thanksgiving. Um, it comes up there on purpose, because it reminds us some of the things to be thankful for, including this. I urge that requests, prayers, intercessions, and thanks be offered on behalf of all people, also for kings and all who are in authority. And that's the added part that might surprise us, right? If you just stop with the earlier bit, give thanks for all people, oh sure, that's a good thing. But also, <laughs> also for kings and those in authority. Whoa! Okay, you got our attention there again, right? Why? So that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. That's good. And God is pleased when it happens. Why? Look at the chain of logic here. Because God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Excuse me. Yeah, please. I, I have to comment on this. I'm please. My tongue. Um, when you referred to um, the North Korean emperor and, and yeah. Hitler and all those guys, yeah. I don't see those as being individuals that, that God is looking at for us to appreciate because they right. didn't bring right. good godliness and dignity yes. to the people at that yes. time. And I, I, I feel that that was a rise of the of Satan and, and what he was attempting to do. And yes. that, that yes. God, through the, the other governments that existed around the globe, that yes. entered into the Second World War, saw to it that this did not continue. And that's how he works through government, but I don't think he worked through them. <laughs> Myself, I don't see that. Thank you. Okay. We're going to come back to this. Okay. I've got this okay. built in. Okay. Because your reaction is entirely natural, expected, good, and right. Thank you. Okay, but, but wrong, I guess. <laughs> well, no, no, not wrong. There are there are limitations to any model that we can, any theological model or construct that we can come up with, and and you're putting your finger on one of the real limitations of this. Yeah, we'll 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 get to that in a bit. Um, right. And what you're jumping out of in this passage is, I think, the critical part in the middle, which I didn't highlight. I didn't know you were going to say that at that point. But, you know, you're right. Why has God appointed kings and all authority and all in authority? Why do we pray for them? So that we can live those quiet and peaceful lives in all godliness and dignity, right? That's the job that God entrusts to the left-hand kingdom. And if the left-hand kingdom is not doing that job, then you're right. Then 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 this all changes, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Oh. So yeah, <laughs> here's, here's where it's starting to get to a little bit of this, right? Do we see our government in that way? Completely. Uh, not, no, not completely, right? 
I, I have to say, and I'm as much included in this as any of us are, you know, we, we live in a culture where it kind of becomes a bit of a popular sport to complain about our government and bash our government. Uh, regardless, whatever government it is, right, from whichever side you're on, um, you can find something to bash in the government that represents the people on the other side of all of those polarities. So, yeah, I don't know how you felt when you watched the election coverage last night. Um, well, <laughs> we, we sow the seed and if it grows, so it grows. If there's a word here for us, then, then let's, let's hear it. Perhaps you remember a couple of times ago, in the first session, we talked about the hiddenness of God and how in many respects, um, he hides from us on purpose and wears masks that show us only what he wants to reveal of himself and only what is safe for us to know about himself. He's protecting us, not just being cagey in doing this. And this is exactly the terminology that Luther applies when he's talking about the two kingdoms, specifically the kingdom of the left. Um, he wants the kingdom of the world, uh, sorry, the government of the world to be a symbol of true salvation and of the kingdom of heaven, like a pantomime or a mask. It's not the real thing. Definitely not the real thing. So, again, just, I guess, to go back to and reinforce what we were talking about there a couple of weeks ago. This is one of the macro things that Luther, that fascinates Luther, and he talks about it in context after context, decade after decade, how God comes to us in hidden ways, wearing masks, asking for faith, also then giving us the faith that we need in order to see him at work in those places. Because without faith, you would not think that God was there, right? You would just think, it's the police officer, or you would just think um, it's a dead guy on a tree, or, you know, in the case of Christ, right? Nice guy, but, you know, met lots of nice guys before, or it's just a little bit of water. What can that possibly 